In about the year 615, the Archangel Gabriel spoke to a merchant from Mecca. Allah has made plain to you the religion which he commended unto Noah and unto Abraham and Moses and Jesus to establish religion and not to be divided therein. The merchant was the prophet Muhammad and the list of names, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, gives the family link between the three great Middle Eastern religions, Jews, Christians, Muslims. All worship one God whose instructions to man, they all believe, began here, on Mount Sinai, where he first gave the law to Moses. Each of the three religions since then has recorded in writing further words of God to man. They are all in the powerful phrase of the Quran, people of the book. At the foot of Mount Sinai is a Christian monastery, St. Catherine's. It has stood here for 1400 years, and for most of that time it has been in Muslim territory. Its massive walls make it look like a Christian fortress under attack from Islam. But the very opposite has been the case. The Bedouin have guarded the monastery and served the monks. A Muslim mosque lies within the Christian walls of the monastery. Prayers to Allah rise side by side with prayers to Jesus. But the desert was to go its own way. The Muslim religion, Islam, meaning submission to the will of God, began among merchants. Muhammad was one himself when Gabriel first spoke to him, and Gabriel's message was simple, very similar to that preached by Jesus and before him by the Jewish prophets. Repent, for the day of judgment is at hand. In the Quran, a believer was given a set of rules which would enable him to survive that judgment clearly defined rules on questions of morals, of law, and of worship. It was all very much simpler than the mysteries of Christianity. Mysteries which led a caliph to comment, Why have the Christian people split into 72 races? Why do they profess three gods? Why do they adore the bones of apostles and prophets? Instead of the complexities of Christian worship, a Muslim needs only his prayer mat. Instead of a hierarchy of priests, he's advised by individual holy men whose authority comes only from knowing the Quran. In place of that most mysterious of mysteries, the Trinity, here there really is only one God, Allah. Such a religion was ideal for the nomads of the desert, accustomed to moving vast distances with nothing but their camels and very few possessions. Inspired by a new faith, they soon found a new role. The armies of Islam moved with astonishing speed. They broke out of Arabia, and within 15 years of the death of Muhammad, they had moved deep into Christendom. Palestine and Syria had fallen, and they were racing west through Christian Africa. The most important city which they captured was Jerusalem.
The place which they chose to build a Muslim shrine was the site of the ruined Jewish temple. For many centuries, the western or wailing wall was the only part of the destroyed temple which remained accessible to the Jews, which is why they consider it holy. But these massive blocks of stone were only one section of the outer wall supporting the great platform above on which the temple had stood. One of the chief causes of friction between the people of the book has been that so many of their holy places are the same. Even in the 1970s, riots have been caused because Jews, as well as Muslims, want to pray up here on the Temple Mount. The last Jewish temple was destroyed in the year 70 by the Romans. And no detail survives of it now up here except for one small part, but that was the original holiest part, a bare patch of rock on which it was believed Abraham had offered his son Isaac as a sacrifice to God, and which David later chose as the site for the first temple, and so which became the inner sanctuary, the Holy of Holies. And the reason it survives now is simple. The Muslims also venerate Abraham. And for good measure, in a form of economy which is almost usual in religious legend, they decided that from that same patch of rock, Muhammad had ascended into heaven. When the Arabs captured Jerusalem in 638, this whole temple area was a derelict site in the middle of a Christian Byzantine city, much as the Romans had left it six centuries before. And the documents say that the Jews eagerly helped the Arabs to clear away the ancient rubble. But no doubt they were rather less enthusiastic when they saw a superb Muslim shrine rising over their sacred rock, the Dome of the Rock. It stands today as impressive as it did 1,300 years ago. Its splendor was a matter of deliberate policy. The Caliph Abd al-Malik, noting the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and its magnificence, feared that it might dazzle the minds of Muslims and so erected the Dome of the Rock. Muslims worshipping here were reminded that Christianity is partly right, or at least not wholly wrong. The Quran says, O people of the book, speak nothing about God but the truth. The Messiah, Jesus, was the messenger of God. So believe in God and his messengers, and say not three in one. God is only one God. Beneath the great dome which the Caliph built is the Holy of Holies, the bare patch of rock which is sacred to the Jewish God. In a cave hollowed out below it, people now pray to the Muslim God. Jews worshipped at this rock for ten centuries. Muslims have done so for even longer. So, in Jerusalem, the Muslims adopted what had been a holy place for the Jews. In Damascus, the next great city which they captured, they built on the site of a Christian church. The church had been dedicated to John the Baptist, and Muslims coming to the mosque today still pray to him. The head of John the Baptist is said to be preserved in this ornate shrine, itself like a miniature version of a Christian church. The reason the Muslims venerate John the Baptist derives from the Quran. Just as it acknowledges Jesus as a prophet, so it describes John the Baptist as one of the righteous, someone good Muslims should revere. Even before this place became a Christian church, it had been a temple to a Roman god, and before that, a Babylonian temple. Throughout history, new religions have moved like hermit crabs into the shells left by their predecessors. Surprisingly, the Muslims met with little resentment from the local Christians when they arrived here. 
Muslim rulers, many Christians felt, might be no worse than the Christian emperors in distant Constantinople, whose officials caused much local resentment. So many Christians collaborated with the new arrivals. The ancient watchtowers, which had guarded the Christian church, were used to call the people to Muslim prayers, the first minarets. The oldest is still known as the Minaret of Jesus. Jesus and John the Baptist had found themselves transferred, quite peacefully, from church to mosque. The tiny village of Sadad, near Damascus, illustrates how Christians and Muslims were able to live together. In spite of appearances, these people are Christians. Their village was Christian before the Muslim conquest, and it is Christian still. It is amazing that this small Christian community has survived. Again, the Quran explains why. It says that other people of the book must be allowed to worship God in their own way. We have faith in that which has been revealed to us and in that which has been revealed to you. Our God and your God are one, and to him we are resigned. <laughs> So the Christians of Sadad survive, although the Crusaders, when they reached Syria, considered such Christians almost indistinguishable from Muslims. They have mingled among the heathen and learnt their works. They use Arabic in their common speech and they use the Arabic script in deeds and business and all other writings except for the Holy Scriptures. They are brought up among those Saracens whose crooked ways they for the most part imitate. North Africa was the other area into which Islam was moving. It had been one of the richest provinces of the Roman Empire. It was strongly Christian at the time of St. Augustine, and within a century of Muhammad's death, it had become as Muslim as it remains today. This is Kairouan in Tunisia. Kairouan was the base from which the Muslims conquered the rest of North Africa. Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, until they stood at the open back door of Christian Europe. In 711, the Muslims were ready to go further. They crossed the narrow straits of Gibraltar. Within three years, almost the whole of Spain was theirs. Their capital, Cordoba. Islam has left a lasting mark on Christian Spain, hardly surprising since the Muslims held part of it for nearly 800 years. Even the cathedral here at Cordova is, in fact, a mosque. The interior of the mosque shows the Arabs settling down to create a Muslim Spain. At first, once again, they built with any old columns lying around from the Roman Empire. They were of various heights, so they are set in the floor at different levels. Later, the Muslims were to make the building unmistakably their own. Soon there was no richer city between here and Constantinople, and it was a city of learning. Like many great mosques, this one was also a college with a library of half a million books. The desert tribes had come a long way since they had first gazed in wonder at the Christian civilization of the East. The tables were now turned, as one bishop of Cordova bitterly complained. My fellow Christians delight in the poems and romances of the Arabs. They study the works of Muslim theologians and philosophers not in order to refute them, 
but to acquire a correct and elegant Arabic style. The pity of it. Christians have forgotten their own tongue. Scarcely one in a thousand is able to compose in fair Latin a letter to a friend. What the mosque in Cordova must have been then can be seen today at the Al-Azhar University Mosque in Cairo, the oldest surviving university in the world. Western Europe is proud of its early universities. Bologna, founded in about 1100, Paris, 1160, Oxford, a few years later. But this place was already two centuries old when Oxford was founded. Teaching has gone on here for more than a thousand years. When this university was founded, the West was still illiterate and violent, but its people had a restless energy, seeking wider horizons. The Muslim world was soon to face a new threat. In 1095, and throughout the next century, bands of heavily armed men streamed eastward. Their enthusiasm derived from a powerful mixture, idealism, and greed. It was a formula for violence. We shall slay for the love of God, proclaimed one crusader slogan. But why wait until Jerusalem when there were infidels on their own doorstep? The Jews. We have set out to fight the enemies of God in the East and behold, before our very eyes are his worst foes, the Jews. They must be dealt with first. They were. The first crusade was launched with a massacre of thousands of Jews, particularly in the towns of Germany, in what was to become almost a traditional beginning. The Pope had promised that Christians who died on the crusade would go to heaven, and a death on either side would be pleasing to the Lord, as St. Bernard explained. The liberality of God is revealed in the death of a Christian because he is led out to his reward. A Christian glories in the death of a Muslim because Christ is glorified. Jerusalem fell to the Crusaders one hot July day in 1099. In the name of the Prince of Peace, a massacre took place which was unusual in its ferocity, even for those savage times. With drawn swords, our people ran through the city, nor did they spare anyone, not even those pleading for mercy. If you'd been there, your feet would have been stained up to the ankles with blood. The horses waded in blood up to their knees, nay, up to their bridle. It was a just and wonderful judgment of God. What more shall I tell? Not one of them was allowed to live. It was not quite true. The Muslim governor of the city paid over enough to buy his escape. The Jews, who took shelter in their synagogue, were burnt alive. It was not an isolated incident of crusader brutality. This pleasantly painted miniature shows an English hero, Richard the Lionheart, after he had captured the city of Acre. Sitting as if in the royal box at a tournament, he presides over the execution of 2,700 Muslims. The Crusaders needed strong castles to hold down the rich territories they had won. Today, their famous castles are the only trace of the knights from the West. The greatest castle of them all, dominating the chief route south to Jerusalem, is Crac des Chevaliers, the Castle of the Knights, referred to by an Arab writer as a bone in the th Inside, covered roadways, angled and pierced for sudden ambush, lead up into the castle. 
But even if an intruder gets through them, he emerges only between the two great rings of the castle wall. This is a giant in a perfect suit of armor, expecting a fight and certain of winning it. Even in times of peace, Krak held 2,000 fighting men, but they weren't merely a garrison. If you look down inside the castle, you sense a different atmosphere. These pleasant Gothic arches were the cloister, and in the 13th century, monks of a sort used to walk here. I suppose that from time to time they read a sacred text, as good monks should. And there's a Latin jingle carved in the stone over there which warns them against pride. And these particular monks may have needed that warning because they were just as likely to be planning a raid against the neighboring Muslims. They would strap on armor over their long black robes which had a white cross on the chest and ride out to battle. Nearly all the important Crusader castles at that time belonged to two great military orders, the Templars and the Hospitallers. They'd both been founded soon after the First Crusade captured Jerusalem, and their members took the same vows as any ordinary monk. They vowed poverty, obedience, chastity. But their real function was fighting, and they were known as the Knights Templar, or the Knights Hospitaller. The monastic knights came to seem almost a symbol of the crusading movement, but their fortunes reflect the slow end. They lost Krak to the Muslims in 1271. Twenty years later, they had been pushed from the mainland entirely. They became the Knights of Rhodes, and finally, even further west, just the Knights of tiny Malta. The Crusades were over. They had created little except a misleading fund of romantic stories and a new legacy of bitterness between the people of the book. The Crusades had been expeditions across and around the Mediterranean. That meant there was another side to them, trade with the East. And Venice took part in them more to improve her trade than to spread Christianity. Venice today seems a tired old city. Beautiful, worldly wise, decked out in the finery that comes from centuries of power. But in the 12th century, it was Constantinople that was all those things. Venice was by comparison an upstart place with more of a future than a past. But she was ready now to expand her trade further east where her interests would clash with those of Constantinople. Venice's great church is dedicated to a saint from the east, St. Mark. He was believed to have died in Egypt. The mosaic above the doorway shows his remains being brought from there to Venice. It's typical that the church named after him borrows its style from the Eastern Empire. It was perhaps even modeled directly on a church in Constantinople. The older city had taught Venice her architecture and much else besides. But the pupil was about to replace the teacher in what became the most shameful crusade of all. In 1202, Venice devised a sinister plan. When the Fourth Crusade was sailing eastwards to attack Egypt, Venice provided the ships, and she provided them on credit. The crusaders could pay with the wealth which they would win in the east. What they presumably didn't know was that the Doge of Venice had recently signed a friendly trading agreement with the Sultan of Egypt. He had absolutely no intention of letting them reach Egypt, and he suggested calling in at Constantinople on the way, which they accepted. As allies and Christians, the Western Knights were free to enter Constantinople, and they wandered round, much like tourists, staring wide-eyed at the treasures of what was then the richest city in the whole world. 
The result, as the Doge well knew, was inevitable. There were political and religious differences between the over-sophisticated hosts and their rough guests. There was the mounting debt to Venice still to be paid. And there was the frustration of a crusade which had set off in high spirits and had got nowhere. When the violence began, it developed into three days of indiscriminate looting. Mounted men rode into the great cathedral of Santa Sofia and smashed up the altar for its silver and gold ornaments. They placed a prostitute on the patriarch's throne and she obligingly sang them a bawdy song in French. When they calmed down, they decided to share things out on a more rational basis. One share for each foot soldier, two shares for a priest, and of course, the lion's share for Venice. The acquisitions of the Fourth Crusade still grace the city. The sculpture of four Roman emperors, loot. Ancient reliefs dotted like postage stamps, loot. Even the great bronze horses, almost by now a symbol of Venice, loot. They had stood in the Hippodrome of Constantine's city. Many of the most beautiful objects in the treasury of St. Mark's were brought back from that crusade. Their arrival proved a great inspiration to European craftsmen. Their quiet perfection makes an odd contrast to the event which brought them here. The crusaders who sacked Constantinople were angrily rebuked by the Pope himself. It was not against the infidel, but against Christians that you drew your swords. It was not Jerusalem that you captured, but Constantinople. It was not heavenly riches upon which your minds were set, but earthly ones. Nothing has been sacred to you. You have violated married women, widows, even nuns. You have despoiled the very sanctuary of God's church, stolen the sacred objects of altars, and pillaged the relics of saints. It is hardly surprising that the Greek church sees in you the works of the devil. Even Venice's most spectacular treasure, the Pala d'Oro, has a top layer which was brought back as loot. But Constantinople lost her confidence along with her riches. What had been the strongest city in the world under the special protection of the Virgin Mary fell eventually into Muslim hands. The Crusaders had intended to recover Jerusalem from the Muslims. Instead, they had yielded them Constantinople. But Venice was better off and firmly enthroned as the Queen of the Adriatic. Not everyone was quite as grasping as the Venetians or as brutal as the First Crusaders. Towards the end of the 12th century, a few Christians began to wonder whether converting the Muslims might not be a better idea than assaulting them. And one of the strangest events in the whole remarkable story of the Crusades arose out of this idea. In 1219, the Crusaders were besieging the town of Damietta in Egypt, when a scruffy-looking friar surrendered himself to the Muslim guards and said, take me to your leader. He was St. Francis of Assisi, and he traveled all the way from Italy to convert the Sultan. Amazingly, the Muslim soldiers did take him into the royal presence and he was politely received. Perhaps because in the East, anyone looking so poor, so dirty, so filled with conviction, will always be given a kindly hearing as a holy man. St. Francis explained to the Sultan the merits of Christianity. And then he asked for a bonfire, which he could step into, to demonstrate his faith. Well, the Sultan was a considerate man, and he said no to this display of zeal, but he did listen, and he sent the saint safely on his way. That much was fact, but legend added another chapter. When St. Francis arrived back in Italy, he was sent for by someone as free-thinking as himself. He was sent for, so the story goes, by the Emperor Frederick II, a man of insatiable curiosity, who promptly locked the saint up in a room with a beautiful girl, and settled down to watch the encounter through the keyhole. St. Francis, who emerges from these stories as something of a pyromaniac, had a neat solution. He would lie with the lady, he told her, if she would join him on a bed of coals, which he would rake out from the fire onto the hearth. 
The Emperor was so impressed that he immediately dismissed the girl and spent the night in earnest conversation with Francis. Well, if Francis told him that one should reason with the Muslims, he was speaking to the converted because Frederick II had grown up in Sicily. This island has long been a meeting place between East and West, as well as between Africa and Europe. It was an important part of the ancient Greek Empire, then of the Carthaginian Empire, of the Roman Empire, of the Byzantine Empire. It was conquered by Arabs from North Africa in the 10th century and by Normans from France in the 11th. The columns of this ancient Greek temple are imitated in the medieval chapel built in Palermo by Frederick's grandfather. In this building are all the traditions of medieval Sicily. The classical past, the mosaics of Christianity, the patterns of Islam, all come together in a delightful compromise. They were broad-minded in more than their artistic tastes, these kings of Sicily. Frederick II loved talking with theologians of all three religions, and it's said that he loved to scandalize them by announcing that there had been three great imposters in the history of the world, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. He did himself take one leaf from the notebook of Muhammad because he kept a harem, and that's how he got his title, the baptized sultan. When it came to crusading, Frederick was clearly not the man to slaughter his way eastwards with the simple faith of any ordinary Christian knight. Instead, he achieved the remarkable feat of capturing Jerusalem without even drawing his sword. And he did so by visiting the same sultan who had received St. Francis, that was only 10 years before, and making a treaty whereby the Christians would receive Jerusalem, but they would allow the Jews and the Muslims to continue to worship there. Frederick, in fact, called it the city of three religions. There was one other part of Europe with a similar background, where rulers even called themselves kings of three religions, Spain. No other European country had such a large or brilliant community of Jews. None had been familiar for so long with the talents of the Muslims. And nowhere could the pleasures of Islam be experienced so fully as in the Alhambra at Granada. Courtyards with their permanent sound of water are like what the Quran promises in paradise. By the time the Alhambra was built, Christians and Muslims had been living side by side in Spain for 600 years. On the whole, it had been a fruitful relationship though usually it was the Christians who learnt from the Muslims. Muslims in Spain reintroduced much of Greek thought to Europe, and the man who reconciled it with medieval Christianity was St. Thomas Aquinas. He was a Dominican, a black friar, and the Dominicans were now playing a leading part in the developing universities of Europe. But there was a darker side to the intellectual energies of these friars. The first interest of their founder, St. Dominic, had been preaching against heresy. His followers were a natural choice as inquisitors, seeking out heretics and handing them over to the civil power for punishment. <laughs> Uh -huh. 
Spain would become the richest hunting ground for the Inquisition. Only here were the both Jews and Muslims who could be converted and who, once converted, could be suspected of backsliding. Over the centuries, crusade after crusade had been launched from the north to free southern Spain from the Muslims. The tolerant land of three religions would eventually be turned into the most intolerant of all Christian countries. The hillside opposite the Alhambra saw the change. Granada was the last Spanish city in Muslim hands, and today this remains the least altered of all the old Muslim quarters of Spain. A few of the houses even have their original Muslim interiors. Wooden ceilings painted in elaborate arabesques in small open rooms giving on to garden courtyards. And in the middle of the courtyard there used to be a pool for ritual washing. But anyone using that pool in a Muslim fashion after 1502 did so at grave risk from the prying eyes of the Spanish Inquisition. Because by then, by royal decree, it was illegal for any Jew or any Muslim to practice his religion. The final act in the long Spanish crusade had happened here in Granada in 1492. In that year, on January the 2nd, for the first time, a Christian flag flew over the Alhambra. It was the flag of Ferdinand and Isabella. The sword is Ferdinand's, the scepter, Isabella's. In their marriage, Christian Spain had found a new unity. Ferdinand brought his kingdom of Aragon. Isabella brought Castile. Together they conquered Granada, and it was here that they chose to be buried. Their most Catholic Majesties. That was their joint title, and they made the most of their Christian zeal. The great altarpiece here reflects that zeal. Isabella's personal confessor, the notorious Inquisitor Torquemada, would certainly have approved of this lurid display of devotion. And it makes much of their greatest victory for the faith, their conquest of the Muslims of Granada. This relief shows the Muslims handing over the keys of the city while Ferdinand and Isabella ride in in triumph. And this one, an event which happened ten years later, when the Muslims of the city were given a simple choice. Burn the Quran, become a baptized Christian, or leave. It was a choice which the Jews of Spain had already faced in that year of 1492. Granada had fallen in January. In March, Ferdinand and Isabella took Torquemada's advice and signed a decree that all Jews must leave the country by the end of July. Almost 200,000 of them left, many of them oddly enough to Constantinople where the official policy was to welcome them. And those that stayed by pretending to convert to Christianity kept the Inquisition busy for many years to come. And so the country which had been the most tolerant in all medieval Europe became now notorious as the most intolerant of all. It was the end of a long story, yet it was also the beginning of another, because only two days after the deadline for the Jews, that same year of 1492 saw yet another momentous event. On August the 2nd, Columbus set sail in the service of Ferdinand and Isabella not only to find a new trade route to the east, or lands rich in gold, but also to convert more infidels for Christ. Your Highness has decided to send me, Christopher Columbus, to the princes and peoples of India, and to consider the best means for their conversion. For you have always been enemies of the sect of Mohammed and all idolatries and heresies. 
Columbus sailed west, expecting to find Asia and the Muslims. Instead, he found a whole new world of infidels suitable for another crusade along the same old lines, with that powerful blend of courage, cruelty, idealism, and greed. Thank you.